Okay, so I think we're going to get started. I'm just going to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. I am Kirsten Connect now. I grew up with my family on Bountiful Blessings Farm, growing vegetables, which I enjoyed, and I love, I love agriculture, but I found that I love flowers even more. So I remember doing, growing flowers from a fairly young age. I would often pick wildflowers and do Sabbath bouquets for my mom. And then another, another memory I have of flowers is at the age of 11, our family had a greenhouse full of bedding plants that we were selling. And most of them were flowers. And I was in charge of the greenhouse, and I knew all the flower names, and I was in charge of selling them. And that's probably one of my first real memories of, like, working with flowers and selling them, and I really did love it. And one beautiful thing about growing up on the farm, it really gives you a lot of practical skills, and it, I don't know how, but it just instills kind of this business mindset in you. So from a very young age, I think seven was my first business, I sold um, granola, and then it, it went from granola to bread. And then when I was older, I did um, bath and body products, sold soap and other lotions and stuff. And um, throughout the whole time of doing businesses and, and uh, figuring out what I, wanted, what I wanted to focus on, my dad, my dad would be like, you should do flowers. And he would go to um, growing seminars, and he'd always go to the flower growing seminars. And then he'd come home, and he'd be like, you, re- you should really grow flowers. And he'd, he'd tell me, I think you could earn more on flowers than some of these other businesses. And looking back, I'm sure he was right. But I think because I was just full-time on vegetable production, I didn't, for my hobby and my little businesses, I wasn't really enthused about growing more things. But um, now... So then I did a couple summers of growing flowers when I was still working daily with my family. But then Nick came along as an apprentice, and we got married almost two years ago. And I've been trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's a niche that I can focus on? And so I started thinking, well, I have some land here by our little tiny house. Maybe I will try my hands at the flowers again. And I don't, I, I am no expert to say the least, but I do love flowers. It's definitely a passion of mine, and I just want to share with you some of the basics to get you started and just share from my experience the beauty of flowers. So some of the topics that we are going to cover today, um, why flowers, the best varieties for year one and beyond, harvesting, arranging um, in your presentation, marketing, where to buy seeds and supplies, and then some of my favorite books and resources. So if you have questions on, like, the growing aspect or, like, fertility, you know, actually growing your plants, I'm kind of assuming that you have some of that knowledge. And if you don't, there's great resources out there. We're going to really focus on flowers, flower varieties, and to get you going with a flower business. So there's a lot of basic knowledge that you can get somewhere else. So we're going to just focus on the flowers this time. And I have a lot to cover, so it's going to be fast-paced. So why flowers? Here's a quote from Ellen White. She had so much to say about flowers, and it was hard to pick just one quote. But this one I thought was really beautiful. And even though it's talking to parents, I feel like it applies to all of us. As does the first sentence say, all both young and old should be in the open air as much as possible. That, That sounds... That sounds like a pretty serious thing. And every family should have a plot of ground for cultivation and for beauty. Parents, a flower garden will be a blessing to your children. It will pay to expend a small sum yearly in the purchasing of flower seeds and shrubs. And then she goes on from that little section to tell about her escapades getting flower seeds and roots. And she was, she was quite the gardener, and she would travel you know, all across state even to pick up some dahlia tubers or some roots here from there and so she has quite the example that she has left us and I thought that was a beautiful quote one of many so I'd encourage you if you haven't gone through and read some of what she says on flowers it's very she has lots of inspirational things to say and how flowers are benefiting to all of us so more why flowers they, they have an almost universal appeal. So I'm coming from vegetable 
background growing. So unlike carrots, beets, or Brussels sprouts, you don't have to be on a diet or be into healthy living to be drawn by the beauty of flowers. So that's something, that, that's a plus. You know, people who come to our market stand, they, to buy, the veg, to buy the vegetables and pay a little bit more for the organic food, they have to be kind of into that. But everybody loves beautiful flowers. And they bring happiness and smiles. And this is something that I really like. And it's, it's really fun to be at market and just see the eyes light up when they, when they see my booth across the way and they come over. And it's really, another thing about flowers is they, they're often bought as gifts. And so the happiness just keeps continuing. And so it always makes me feel good when, you know, Mr. Joe comes and he's buying a bouquet for his sick wife at home because I know those flowers are going home and they're just going to brighten somebody else's day just like they have brightened my day. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities there for evangelism. And I have, I tried, I kind of had this, uh, this policy or this goal this year to always give away at least one bouquet every week. And that was fun. So I'd go into it kind of thinking, okay, who am I going to give this bouquet to this week? And that was fun. And then I have ideas for, you know, putting, like, scripture cards on them or just something to kind of take it to the next level of um, spiritual conversation. So another comparison to vegetables, if you have a tomato crop failure, that's pretty devastating. You know, everybody likes tomatoes, and they're kind of a staple for your CSA. But if my cosmos don't do well, say, one year, I can just fill in with another flower that's pretty. You know, there's no, there's no, like, there are staple flowers, but to somebody else it's not necessarily staple. It just has to look pretty. So it's aesthetically drawn, and so, you know, if one crop doesn't do well, you just put in another flower that's pretty, and you're, you're good to go. There's not, there's not as much pressure as I think there are in vegetables, as long as you have, you know, your variety that you need. And the last, the last point is profitability. And the local flower movement is, I think, just a few years behind the local food movement. They're kind of, they're kind of going together. And it, it, I think for years people kind of discredited buying organic and local flowers because it's like, well, we don't eat them. You know, what's the difference? But people are starting to see the difference, and florists are now starting to have to wear masks and long gloves when they're working with the flowers. And I think that's kind of making people stop and think, like, okay, you have to do that just to work with the flowers. But they're all coming from overseas, and they come just drenched in chemicals. And so people are really starting to see, okay, there's, there is something to this. And I, I think that it's, it's only going to snowball. So at least in our area, there is a kind of a, I would say, a bit of a saturation of local vegetable farmers. You know, if you're a new farmer, you're going to be hard-pressed to get into, you know, one of the really good markets. But as a local flower farmer, I'm pretty much the only one at my market, and I know many other markets don't even have one. So that's kind of an inn where you wouldn't have an inn if you were doing vegetables. So these are... These are the five varieties that I've chosen to talk about today. Now, you're probably familiar with most of these. They're kind of basic, but I want to encourage you that there's real beauty in the basics, and if you do them right, if you, if you grow them right, if you harvest them right, and if you present them right, they're going to sell. And these, with these flowers that I'm going to share with you today, you can have beautiful bouquets all summer long that are going to catch people's eye, and you will sell out. I mean, I haven't... This, this summer, I pretty much sold every last stem I could grow. And that's what told me, okay, there's something to this. I can earn money at this, and I'm just going to expand from, from next year to next year. So I've chosen these ones. They are easy to grow. They have no special germination needs. They are fast-growing. I chose them. They're all pretty much less than 80 days, which is pretty, pretty fast. They're all prolific. They're hardy against heat, drought, disease, and pests. And if you pay attention to varieties, getting unique ones and succession plants, then you're really you're good to go. So we're going to start with sunflowers. Sunflowers are probably one of the most loved flowers. They're kind of the epitome of summer, summer and everybody's, everybody's drawn to them. But one of the trickiest things about sunflowers is it's a one-cut deal for the most part. So that's why you see sunflowers for like 
a couple weeks of the summer, and then they're gone. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can have sunflowers every single week of the summer. So with these three varieties, the cool thing is, if you plant these three, now normally you'd have to plant sunflowers every single week to be able to have blooms every single week, which, I mean, Mrs. Tiffany just talked about microgreens. That's kind of what she's doing. But I'm trying to figure out how I can plant the least amount of, you know, of times. <laughs> so with these three varieties, instead of planting them every single week, you can plant all three of these together every three weeks, and you'll have continuous blooms. So that's a real plus. These, these three varieties you can get from Johnny's. You can get from other places that I can tell you about, too. So another, there's plant spacings. You can plant them nine inches for the larger heads, and then all you have to do is squish them a little smaller, do the six-inch spacing, and you can do mini heads, which are really nice for bouquets, but it just depends on what you're wanting to do. If you want to do um, a bunch of sunflowers for market, you probably are going to want to do the larger ones. But just plant them closer, and you get minis. So harvest when petals, petals are just beginning to open. You can see this one. This one I probably harvested. I think I had just harvested those, but you can harvest them when they're just beginning to lift off the center. And this is something that people often do wrong with sunflowers. They harvest them too late, you know, when they're already open. Then you only have a few days of vase life. Now, of course, people are drawn to them when they're all the way open, but if you pick them when, when they're a little more closed, not only can you hold them for longer, but they're going to be beautiful on people's tables for longer. So that's what I sell them for. A bunch, depending on the size, three to five, I sell for $6. And I also put them in bouquets. So a couple things that you want to look for with sunflowers, if you're looking for varieties, you want to choose pollenless ones. You don't want pollen dropping on people's counters. And ideally, ones with multiple levels of petals. Because if you have ones that just have one ring of petals, then you lose two petals, and that is unsaleable. But all you have to do is get varieties with multiple levels, and you'd never know that you dropped a few petals. So that's just a little trick. So these are all things that are characteristics of those three varieties. They're the most popular ones, just a no-fail. They also, if you, if you look at them, there's different colors. There's gold ones. There's, you know, your black and, black and yellow ones. There's plum ones. There's all different ones. And it's nice to have a variety of different colors. So I would encourage growing several different colors. Sometimes I'll do bunches that's a mix, you know, have a, a yellow and, and black one, a traditional one, or might have, I throw in a plum one. How do you know if it's a no pollen sunflower? Does it say that in the catalog? It says that in the description, but I would say most, most sunflowers that are four cut flower production are already no pollen, but I have grown a couple that I thought were pollenless, and they ended up being quite full of pollen, and it's just a mess. So you want to make sure and it usually says in the description of the sunflower. Aren't they hybrids here, usually? They're, they're probably. That would make sense that they're probably hybrids. I don't, I haven't taken notice of that. <clears throat> so another big favorite and a staple in the cut flower garden are zinnias. And probably the most popular one is the Benary's Giant Series. And there's lots of different colors, but these are the ones that I like the best. The salmon, which you can see in that top picture, it's just a gorgeous coral, peachy color, and it's a very popular color right now, so I would, it, it goes well in anything. People just love it. But you can see, um, so salmon, rose, purple, lime, wine, and yellow are my favorites. The lime down here, you wouldn't think that a green flower would be beautiful, but it's a staple. I love the green ones. I throw them in almost every bouquet. And... A couple other ones, Oklahoma and Sunbow, those are smaller heads, and it really is nice. You know, you can think Xenia is a Xenia, but there's so many different colors and so many different sizes, and if you combine in your bouquet, if you have some smaller ones and some bigger ones, it really adds some dimension to them. So those are great ones, again, in all colors. Sunbows are quite small. Um, Oklahomas are a little bigger. Jazzy. This is a fun one, autumn colors. They're short stems, so they're not good for bouquets, but when I'm doing arrangements for fall, I used a lot of those. Again, just a prolific 
prolific flower, one key with zinnias and all flowers, if you deadhead them and if you don't let them go to seed or get beyond, you know, turn brown, they're going to produce and produce and produce until they... So this one is my favorite. It is called Queen Red Lime. It's a new variety. Last year was the first year that Johnny's was offering it. And it's an antique rose color. It varies. Some of them are more lime colored, but they all have this antique vintage look to them. A very, very popular flower, and it was by far my favorite. It was a little bit more susceptible to powdery mildew, but I would take that for the color. It's an extraordinary color. This year, they are adding... Queen Lime with Blush, which is a lighter, more pale color of the same flower. It's going to be a real winner this year. So I'd say definitely get those varieties. Continuing on with zinnias, for the most part, everything I do is at a 9-inch spacing. So zinnias included. They need a little bit more breathing room. And this is something that I learned this year. If you pinch them at when they're about 18 inches tall, when they're just starting to form the head, of the flower, if you pinch that off, you get tremendous side shoots. Now this is one, if you've grown zinnias before, you know that they kind of branch out. And if you're trying, which when you first start with flowers, you're kind of trying to conserve all your little branches and you only want to cut down to the next branch. Well, this is from flower to next branch. And that's what you get when you pinch them. You get tremendous, tremendous stems. And I, if you want, you can, this is something I'm going to do this next year, I'm going to pinch part of, my, part of my crop, and that will kind of be the same sort of thing as succession planting almost, pinching some of them. They're going to flower a little later, but then you can get earlier flowers with the ones that you don't pinch because, I mean, if you pinch them, you are going to be a couple weeks later. But it gives you a more healthy, robust plant, and your stems are more... They're, they're a more um, equal length. Instead of having all different lengths, they're more uniform. So they're great for working with bouquets. Another important thing with zinnias is to trellis the sides. This year I just used some rebar, or they're, they're stakes that I used at the corners, and then did, I think in the end I had three strands of twine, but it's very important that you trellis the sides or else they're going to fall over and then they're unusable stems. They're not the strongest plant. They have more of a shallow root system. But with trellising the sides, you get straight stems and it's not, it's not a huge amount of additional time. Paris, when you talk about nine inch spacing, but you're doing that in a 30 inch wide bed. Yes, yeah, so, so my beds are 30 inches wide. So my nine inch spacing is three rows to a bed, nine inches between the plants down the bed. So this is, this is how you, you want to tell if a zinnia is ready. Because if you pick a zinnia too early, it's going to just flop, and it's more susceptible to the stems breaking. So this is an easy way to tell if they're ready to harvest. You just wiggle them a little bit, and if the head, if the head flops all over the place, then it's not ready yet. But the next day, even maybe the next afternoon, you wiggle it and it's stiffened. It still, it still has a little bit of wiggle to it, but the head's not flopping around. Then you know that it's ready to harvest. And you also want to harvest before the little ring of florets around the middle opens. Because once that opens, you're down to just a few days of shelf life left on that flower. So you want to pick them before those open. They are cold-sensitive. In that when you harvest them, they don't love to sit in the cooler for very long. You can put them in for a few hours, like before delivery, but don't let them sit for overnight, days at a time, because then they'll start to turn brown and get burnt along the edges. So just a caution for that. They are very susceptible to blights and powdery mildew, especially in the south where I live, with the humid conditions. So what you have to do is just succession plant and plan. It's kind of like tomatoes in our area. You just plan on them dying a few weeks into their production. So I, my goal is to plant every month. So I have about four, four plantings through the summer. And with that, then you can have nonstop flowers. Yeah, the last point was just, I sell them mostly, I put them mostly in my bouquets, but I also <coughs> sell them approximately <laughs> nine a bunch. And I sell them straights for $6. So depending upon the size, 
Just, just yeah. a quick note that um, we are going to have these presentations on audio. Groups, yes. So if you're not able to write fast enough. Yeah, this is. This is fast paced, but my presentation will be available on Audioverse, so you can just find all the slides there afterwards. Celosia, this is another workhorse in the summer flower garden. It comes in all different forms. This one being Kramer's or Chief, and it's the ball or coxcomb type of flower. They, they're pretty large, and they're more of a novelty flower, I would say. They, for me, I don't love to work with them in the bouquets. They're just a little too big and bulky, a little too heavy. But they're a great novelty flower. People are drawn to them just because of their uniqueness. They look like a brain. And they actually sell for pretty good money just because they're unique and weird and <laughs> cool, I guess. <laughs> Pampas plume, that's another quite popular one. It's more of the feathery, plumy one. It's great also for bouquets. My personal favorite is the Bombay or the fan type. And it fits really nicely in bouquets. It still gives you kind of that frilly top, kind of adds some dimension, but it's not, it's easier to work with and slip in than the big ball or the coxcomb one. So <laughs> something that you do have to be aware of with, with Celosia is it can easily become a weed. It self-seeds itself, grows very vigorously, fast, and I have it all over my parents' garden. So, like, this year I didn't even plant it because I knew it was going to come up in every place, and I just harvested it from their garden. <laughs> but, yeah, you just want to, you want to be aware of that. Um, the foliage is also a long-lasting filler. The harvest, you can really harvest it at any stage. But you do want to be careful that you don't harvest it when it's starting to drop its seeds because these things have hundreds and thousands of seeds. And you can see, they'll be all up the bottom. And once they start turning black and you see all the seeds coming out, you just don't want to use that in your bouquets because then there's going to be just this puddle of black seeds around the bouquet on somebody's table. And that's not, that's not the prettiest sight. So it's very prolific, cut and come again. So only a couple plantings you really need. And I would say that these, the top two are available from Johnny's. The Bombay, it's a little more, it's, it's more of a rare variety. It's not super rare, but Johnny's doesn't have it. And it's, it's more of an expensive one. So I'm actually, I just recently got some from Florette Seeds, floretteflowers.com. And she has a beautiful mix of pastel colors that they're more they're a smaller fan type one but it has you know the fans a little bit of plume and so she has some great colors and mixes on her site so I'd encourage you if you're interested in the more fan pastel colors to check out hers. Gonfrina it's a great addition to any bouquet these are the two colors that I grew this year and I was very happy with them bicolor rose and QIS Orange, both of those can be found on Johnny's or elsewhere. And again, I did 9-inch spaces. Yeah, so you can see my bed there. It, even at 9-inch spacing, the whole thing fills up pretty full. But it's, it's a pretty, um, the, the, the stems are fairly stiff, so you don't have to worry about them falling over. They don't need trellising. They're just a super, super easy, prolific flower. And you can harvest them at any stage and do them cut or dried. And I was actually surprised at how big of a seller they were at market. I would just do bunches like this and sell them for, I call, I, I just have a little tag. I don't know if you can see it there. It says, buy me and dry me. And I would tell people, you can enjoy it fresh for a week or whatever. But then you can just take that bouquet, hang it upside down, and then you have a bouquet for all winter long. And that really... People really, really like that. And so just this, like, super cheap, super easy flower then turned into, I was, like, selling tons of them and making a lot of money on this, like, super cheap seed that you don't even have to hardly do anything. They grow, they grow crazy well, and you can harvest them at any stage. I, I kind of let them 
let the, the bicolor rose, it kind of, it grows on a stem that has several shoots. And so I kind of waited until they were all fairly equal size before cutting them. But you really, you can hardly, whereas sunflowers, you can, you know, miss them by just a day, go out and they're like too, too far gone to pick. With these guys, I mean, if they're, if I'm like, I don't have time to pick them next week, I know they'll still be there the following week and I can harvest them then. So a really great easy one and they're great for adding to your bouquet just kind of like a, a pop of color they stick up and they look really nice so again I sell them in the small wraps of shapes for six dollars yeah because I'm just going to do flowers in kind of a rotation of our mm -hmm. is that amaranth one that is okay like it's not going to take over the celosia, you know? the celosia? Or the, the amaranth, is that amaranth in the name? Or the one that was oh, oh, yeah. I mean, they're super easy to weed out. They don't have like a, a root system that takes over like other things we were talking about. So, I mean, all it takes is a little run with the collinear hoe and they're out. So you might have issues with them coming back again, but they're easy to weed out. So you really can't help but have them come up again because you can't, you can't pick them fast enough that they're not going to drop any seeds. They're just like thousands, millions of seeds. So, but yeah, you don't have to worry about them taking over too much as long as you're willing to just weed them out. So cosmos, this is another just basic flower, but they're adding a lot of really, really neat um, ones, varieties. Every year, it's really, it's really fun. Every year, they come out with new flowers, new colors. And so the one that I grew this year was Versailles, but I'm going to grow quite a few new ones this next year. They were just, I mean, they were great, but they were just kind of basic. And some to look at are double-click cupcakes and seashells. I mean, you can see, you turn this, like, regular old flower into just something that florists want to buy, and it doesn't take any longer or more work. So they are a little similar to zinnias. They actually, they have a very shallow root system. All it takes is a little bit of wind and... You can have them knocked over, which isn't any fun. So you won't want to, you can, you can plant them closer together, about six inches, but then also trellis sides. You had a question? What do you do about the stems? They're so fragile. So the question was on the stem. I have actually found them not to be very fragile. It might depend upon which ones you grow. But I think my next point yeah, you want to harvest ideally when they're just beginning to open. If you let them fully open, they become quite fragile. And in your bouquets, it's easy for the petals to get messed up. So again, harvest when they're, when they're just beginning to open, and they're a lot more sturdy for your bouquets. Again, you must succession plant this one, you know, three weeks, four weeks. If you deadhead them, you know, every day when you're harvesting, it's going to last longer, but you're going to want to plant this every three to four weeks. Question? Are you planting this from seed in the garden? Yes. Yeah, so everything I plant from seed, I use soil blocks. I actually use the really small mini soil blocks because I am kind of constrained on space, and I found that that works very well. I put them out when they're quite small, but you'd be amazed at how hardy plants are. And you have to be careful for water to make sure that they don't get water stressed. But everything I do from seed. Kristen? Yes. What do you do about harvesting them? Yes. Yeah, so harvesting, you just have to cut them long and just not worry about the branching off stems. Just take them off. Yeah. And I found sometimes the harder you cut, the more it's going to produce, the more side shoots. Anywhere you're going to cut on your Cosmos stem, it's going to just produce more shoots. So you don't have to worry too much about cutting. <coughs> Cutting too much. Okay, so those were my top five. And it was really, it's really hard to slim it down because there's so many beautiful ones. So like I, I mentioned, those ones were chosen for you know, their hardiness, their ease of growing, the fast maturity. But I did want to just mention a few other ones. Marigolds, they've been breeding marigolds with longer stems. And they, again, are a great summer garden one. They are very, very drought resistant. So they're another just almost no-fail variety. And the two, 
the two of the ones that are better for bouquets because they're longer are the Giant series and the Jedi series. The Jedi series you can only get from Geo Seeds, which is a great company. They have uh, a lot more variety than Johnny's has if you're willing to weed through their massive catalog that's all in botanical names. You know, if you're willing to do that, they're like half the price of any other place I've found and with way more variety. So that's definitely a good, a good research. And the marigold, they're breeding them to come in oranges, of course, yellows, and they're also experimenting with some cream varieties. So there's, you know, marigolds you might think is, oh, that's just a common, common flower, but they're a great one and they're very prolific, you can see. Another one is this Chinese forget-me-not. This I grew this a couple, I did I think three plantings this year, and they're a great one. They are, I will say on germination, they like to germinate in the dark, but if you cover them, I had no problem with germination. I had a really good stand, and they're, they're an awesome blue color that really pops in your summer bouquets. They'll last, they, they don't seem to be too phased by the heat. I was thinking that I wouldn't be able to grow them in the summer, but they actually have done great in my area. So the intense blue from Johnny's, this mystery rose color, I'm really anxious to try. That's from Geo Seeds. But to get a forget-me-not in a rose or pinky color, I think would be really great. So another, just a great one to add to bouquets. Another one is Ageratum. This is another staple for most flower growers. It comes in the planet blue, which is just your regular blue color, but it also comes in white. And it's a little bit more of a fragile flower, but still a great one, a great one for bouquets and for the garden. The last one I would add is this Ami Docus Dara. This is one of the new really popular flowers in the flower community and world. It's a new breed from, it's in the carrot family. Um, so Queen Anne's Lace, they bred it from, from that, but it comes in all different shades. It comes in purple kisses, which is this one. It comes in also some red and pinky colors, and it's a great one. It's a great filler for, for bouquets, and just another really popular one right now that's easy to grow. I think this one takes a little longer germination or days to maturity than some of the other ones, but it's another great one. So that, that gives you some to start with, and there's so many different varieties in all of these. But I do want to mention fillers because fillers are a very important component to, be, to bouquets. It's easy to think, oh, I'm going to plant all these flowers. But flowers are only one component of your bouquet. you got to have your fillers. So a uh, favorite filler is basil. And it has such a nice scent in your bouquets. You know, it draws people. I'll have people come to the stand just because they smelled something and they point it to the bouquets. And so that's a, a great one. I grew Aromata this year, and it's, it's a purpley color one. I really like it when it goes to seeds at the top or flowers at the top. It's really, really great. But you have to be careful with basil because it, it's very sensitive to heat. So you want to harvest it in the evening and put it in your water. And then it's also, it's kind of a, it's a little bit tricky because it's then also very sensitive to cold. It does not like to be in the cooler whatsoever. So if I put it in bouquets, I can get away with putting it in the cooler for a couple hours before I leave to delivery, which I really like to do because I like my flowers to be really fresh and crisp. So I'll stick it in the cooler for a couple hours before I leave, and it works okay like that. Another trick is if you grow the darker colored leaves, if it does get a little bit of burn from the cooler, you don't even hardly notice. So that's another good thing about doing the, the darker leaves. Another good one is cinnamon basil and lemon basil, but those are lighter colors. So I really like the aromata. How, what temperature is your cooler at when you put it in the cooler? What, what temperature would it be at? It varies depending upon the season. Yeah, so our cooler is usually upper 30s, and it, it just is dependent upon the season. And I do kind of a no-no because we just have one cooler on the farm, and I just put I put the flowers in there with the cooler, which isn't the best idea. But so far, I haven't had any problem with ethylene. 
So amaranth, this is another great filler. It's super easy to grow, super fast. It's Celosia is in the same family. It, it reseeds itself very easily. I grew this one this year, and it was, it was really nice in my autumn bouquets. I let it grow till the seed had developed, and it really added a nice touch. But there's so many different kinds of amaranth, and a very popular one is coral fountains. And there's lots of different colors of those, too. So, there, you know, you can, you can think of one of these flowers, and it's like amaranth. But there is, like, dozens of different kinds of amaranth and different colors. So these other ones, dill, you know, you probably have dill in your garden. Once it goes to seed, it's a great filler. It's like little fireworks. Mint, I harvest mint from the garden, or from the creek, actually. It grows in our creek. And I can usually get long enough strands to put some in my bouquets. And this, too, it's, it's a great, people are drawn because of the scent, because it's very aromatic. And it's a beautiful filler. And then, last but not least, grasses. They make a great filler. So, and there's, there's tons of fillers, but oftentimes, you know, you plant your flowers, you don't think as much about the fillers. So this is just to give you, to encourage you that, you know, things that even are in your garden, dill. You know, just think of, okay, what could I put in my bouquet? Now, you always want to check for vase life and see how long it's going to last, if it would be good in your bouquets. And then when in a pinch, forage. Now this, this takes longer, but I've had some weeks where I just was short on things and so I needed, needed to forage. So there's a list of things that I found really nice for my bouquets that I can just pick out in the field. The picture is of Sweet Annie. It's, a, it's an awesome filler. It has a really sweet scent. It grows in the fall in the field. So this, this is dependent upon location, too. I'm not sure if these things would grow wild where you are. There's probably other things. But a key, again, with using anything wild, you've got to test the vase life. So before I ever put anything in a bouquet, I test how long it's going to last. So I pick, I pick some goldenrod. Now, a key with goldenrod, you know, people aren't going to buy your bouquet if they think it has goldenrod in it. So a trick with it is if you harvest it before the little heads open, before any pollen gets out, I have yet to see it actually open after you pick it. I've left it on the counter for two weeks and never had it open. So it makes a great filler, but you have to harvest it before it opens or is recognizable as goldenrod or nobody's going to buy it. <laughs> it is a myth. Goldenrod has no airborne pollen. Yeah. It yeah. It blooms at the same time as dry leaves. Yes. Yeah, she's making the point that it's a myth that it, it is... Um, allergenic, but it's a myth that people don't know. So that's the unfortunate thing. Like, I know that even when it's open, it really isn't going to make you cough, but people don't know that, and it's just in their heads that goldenrod is going to make them do whatever. I don't have allergies. <laughs> okay, so harvesting. So before I share with you about harvesting, I do want to mention vase life and preserving, preservation for your flowers, like flower food. And you want to make sure your bouquets are going to look good for several days on people's countertops. And because I am doing, growing things organically, I have not found a good organic flower food yet. You know, lots of people use bleach and other things, other harsh, harsher chemicals, which I think you, you have to use some when you're like selling to grocery stores. So you want to be very careful because grocery stores are kind of out of your control. Like your bouquets are going to sit there for who knows how long before they're bought. So you really have to make sure they're going to last. And you probably are going to be forced into using some of these things. And it's a very different story than like spraying chemicals on the flowers. I don't think that it's as it's near as big of a problem. But this year I really tried to do it without doing any preservatives. I'd heard of a, of a farm that did that. So you can do it, and this year I did it, and I had so many compliments about how long my flowers lasted. I didn't have a single person complain, but you have to pay close attention to the next keys that I'm going to share, for, share with you, or else it's not going to work. Like, you can't do it without preservatives if you're, unless you're very careful with your systems and with your harvesting. So the, the top thing is clean buckets. Like, this is a necessity, and the 
The saying is, if you wouldn't drink or eat out of it, your flowers shouldn't either. Like, your buckets have to be spotless. So every time before I harvest, I scrub my buckets really good with soap and water. Also do this with your snips, because it's very important that your snips are clean. You're not passing on those, those germs flower to flower. So before I harvest, I just clean all my buckets. I fill them quarter way full with water and take them to the field with me with clean snips. So clean, sharp snips. And you have to know when to harvest your flowers. Because if you're harvesting them at the wrong time, your bouquet is not going to last. Because you're probably harvesting it after you should have, and you've cut into, you've stolen days from your potential customer, days that they could be enjoying your flowers. So you really have to know when to harvest. And I don't have time to go into all of that. So I would encourage you, if you go to floretteflowers.com on her homepage, she has a free ebook on when to harvest. And it is quite exhaustive. It has tons of different varieties with pictures, and it tells you when is the ideal time to harvest. So I would definitely encourage you to check that out, since I don't have time to go into that. So, and then you also want to, as much as possible, harvest in the cool of the day. Now, sometimes you have to just harvest in the, in the heat of the day. You know, if you, have, if you have orders or just a ton of flowers to harvest. But when you harvest, make sure you get them to the shade as quick as possible. And I like to do it in the evenings. That's my favorite time. I usually harvest in the evenings, put them in the cooler, and then arrange in the morning. Because my, my main market is an afternoon market, so I have time to arrange the bouquets and sell them in the afternoon. But take to the, I think, did I mention the, you want to put directly in, oh yeah, put directly in water. So take your buckets with water to the field with you. And I like to put my buckets like under some of the other plants, so they're kind of in the shade, if possible, if I'm harvesting in the heat of the day. So I like to cut 18 inches down. It's really, when you start, you have the tendency to not cut far enough because you'll have other shoots coming out. But it's going to look more professional if you have a longer stem. Because if you see bouquets in the supermarkets, they have nice long stems. So you want to cut an average of 18 inches down and then strip the lower leaves. When I was first starting, I kind of stripped all of the leaves. But I, I quickly found that it was compromising me with arranging because it's really nice to have those top leaves to kind of fill out your bouquets and you don't have to use as many flowers that way. So I just stripped the lower two-thirds of leaves off the stems. So you just cut it, strip, and you place in your hand. And for efficiency, do large handfuls before taking them back to the bucket. It's a five-gallon bucket? Yes. I, sometimes I'll use, I think my little ones are three gallons. So depending upon you know, which flowers I'm harvesting, I'll either use a three-gallon bucket or a five-gallon bucket. But yeah, I do, I, I cut as many flowers as I can possibly fit in my hand before going back to the bucket. I have a question? Are some flowers, one way you usually put the top Actually, with sunflowers, I take all the leaves off. Yeah, because sunflower leaves, they just don't stay looking nice. They'll droop, and then they make your flowers look bad, even though your flowers look great. How deep in the water are you? Yes. So she's asking how deep. I only fill my buckets when I take them out to harvest. I only, I only fill them like a quarter way or less with water just because it's heavier to carry around. And then when I'm done harvesting, I'll add some more water so they're about half full. But you don't want any of your leaves in the water because it's just going to rot and cause bacteria growth. So put in the shade or place in a cooler direct out of sunlight. So a few tips for arranging. You gotta have a decent table. And you can either place your buckets. I try to keep my buckets like I have a bucket of zinnias. Nothing else is in there. Then I'll have a bucket of my filler, my fillers, you know, my celosia or whatever. Nothing's in there. You know, just just the celosia. So I have my buckets. And you can either keep them in your buckets, or if you're wanting to be really fast, you'll take a bunch and lay it on the table and go down like that. You know, so you'll have your pile of flowers and you'll go down your line. It's, you just you have to get as fast as possible because you're only selling your, your bouquets for, I sell mine for $12. So if that takes me 10 minutes to do, you know, it's, it's not that great. 
So you got to get faster and faster. And so it helps to have kind of a, a production line. So you're just working down the table, and at the end you have your bouquet, your full bouquet. Are you binding the bouquet with a ribbon or anything? Yeah, so I'm going to go into how, how I do that. So these are, these are types of flowers that you want to have ideally in every bouquet. So just think focal and filler and then spike, something that sticks out of the bouquet to kind of catch people's eye. And whimsical, cosmos are whimsical, kind of just flowy, airy. So from what we've talked about so far, what would you say a focal flower is? Sunflower, great. A zinnia, those are your focal flowers. <coughs> Fillers, it could be celosia, it could be, you know, celosia could be either a spike or a filler, depending upon which kind or how you're going to use it, if it's going to stick out or if you're going to kind of tuck it in. Um, basil, amaranth, all the fillers that we talked about. Spike is a gomfrina, that's a great spike. It kind of sticks out, has a little ball on the end, catches people's eyes. <coughs> and then cosmos are a great example for airy or whimsical. Keep loose. You know, the look right now is a very loose, wild bouquet. And so you really want to keep that. So when you're arranging, you want to keep your bouquet loose in your hands. And you're just kind of adding to it. But if you hold it too tight or hold it too far up on the stems, you're going to compress the heads together. And you're not going to come out with an airy looking bouquet. So hold it down farther on the stems and just keep it loose as you're adding to it. So everybody has their own way of arranging. But I find myself grabbing some filler flower first, and then I'll add some focal, and then I'll add some spike or, or airy or whimsical, and then I kind, of add, I kind of end with some filler as well. So you have to kind of figure out what, what um, you know, your style is, how you like to do it. And I mean, I could do a whole presentation just on arranging, because that is an art in and of itself. And everybody can learn it. Some people, it comes easier to than others. You know, some people just kind of have that natural creative eye to see what colors look good together, and then other people have to learn that. So just play with it and do a lot of flowers, and you'll st soon start seeing what looks nice. So another, another thing, five to seven different flowers or fillers. It's not the more the better. You really want your bouquets to not look too busy. So think five to seven kinds of flowers. Now, they could be different colors of kinds, but you know, if you have zinnias, gomphrina, cosmos, basil, a sunflower, like that's a great bouquet right there. Don't go overboard with, oh, I have tons of different varieties. Just do some of your bouquets with five of this variety, other bouquets with five or seven of this variety. So they can be different, but don't just put everything together in one bouquet. You don't want it to look too busy. So another thing, I, I was trying to think when I was putting this together, like how many stems I use. But I would say between, you know, you can decide which size bouquet you want to make. But I would say I use between 15 and 20. That's including the filler. That's, that's everything, yeah. And you have to cut to the shortest stem length. And when you're out there in the field, it's easy to think, oh, I'm just going to cut this one a little shorter because there's this nice Nice one coming off down here, but I'm telling you, I regret it every time I go to a range because that, I have to cut everything to that shortest length. And so now I cut all these others great, nice, long, but what use? I either throw out that short one or I have to cut them all to it. So just, just try to keep the stems long and don't throw in those short ones. And I rubber band down low to keep that loose, full look. I use 32, number 32, rubber bands. Question? Do you grow your own ferns? Ferns? I don't grow my own ferns. I can't really speak to that. I know they like shade. I don't use ferns. Yeah. No, I, I know ferns are nice for some arrangements, but I haven't really seen them used in bouquets. So I know they grow wild in our woods. They really like shade. I haven't really gotten into those types of plants. So then you want to put in a sleeve or wrap in paper for protection. And I'm actually going to show you how I do that here in a second. Presentation is key. At the beginning of my flower season this year, I just sent bouquets to market in mason jars. And they were gorgeous bouquets, but I really didn't sell as many as I thought I should. Like, they lasted way longer than I would have expected. 
and at the end of market, I'd still have one or two bouquets. So I, I learned really quickly that presentation, like how you're selling them. People are used to buying bouquets in a sleeve. They're used to just grabbing something, and it's protected on the outside. So I started wrapping mine in paper, and this is how they look going to market. I have them in a bucket, I have a nice little sign on it, and I have them wrapped in craft paper. So it still has that country look, it's not, it's not you know, plastic, but they're protected. So it, it's, a, it's made it really nice for taking to market because I don't have to be so concerned about all the loose, loose ones on the side. Question? That's sitting in water. That is sitting in water. It's like half full, so I just have the ends in water. So the paper, I still have a good deal of length of stem beyond. And if I get to market and the water has splashed, I can just easily re redo it. Now at my size, I, I can afford to hand tie them. If I was doing a ton of bouquets, which I'm hoping to do more this next year for grocery store sales, I probably am not going to have the time and it's going to cut into that. And so I might, I might lose a little bit <clears throat> of the aesthetic appeal of a hand tied bouquet, but you can get you can get uh, craft paper sleeves. A company that's great to get them from is Aru. They're an Australian company, but they also have a, a headquarters in Ohio, I believe. It's just A-R-O-O. And they have all different kinds of sleeves, but you have to buy them in bulk. So this year I decided I was just going to just experiment because I wasn't sure how what size I wanted my bouquets to end up being. So I decided just to experiment with hand tying them and then kind of get an idea of what size I was wanting to work with before purchasing a thousand at a time. But that's definitely the way to go. So there are some of my flower bouquets from this year. And I'm just going to show you really quick. This is what I get for my craft paper. It comes at Lowe's. I have a, a list of supplies on the, next, on the next screen. But this is my craft paper. And I actually have a bouquet here of gomfrina that I dried from the summer. So I have my bouquet that I set on the table, and then I just take my roll. I roll it out about that far. I just take my scissors. Yeah, so I have about that big of a piece. I just lay it on the table. I put my bouquet in the middle, and then I, I cut a piece of jute. You can also use baling twine, which is cheaper. And I usually have that all pre-cut. And then I wrap it around. This isn't going to look quite as good as a fresh bouquet because it's not as full. But it has a little... So then that's what it looks like. This one is, is longer stems than I would probably use, but this is just a dry bouquet. And it gives it a real a farmy look. So I do all my straights, straights this way, all my bouquets this way, and it's great and easy. And I sometimes if I don't get them all wrapped before I leave, I just take the supplies to market and just wrap them there. It's just really quick and easy, and it's cheap. So marketing... There, there are so many ways that you can market your flowers. Farmer's market's a great way to get started. Flower CSA, that's another big one right now. People um, sign up for a subscription of flowers where they get a bouquet every week through the summer. That's, that's a great way, too. It's a little, you know, if you're familiar with vegetable CSA, it's the same sort of commitment. So you have to, you have to know that you're going to have flowers every single week. I've contemplated doing that this year, just having an add-on to our CSA for flowers, but I'm, I travel a fair amount, so I'm not sure if I want to commit to doing that. Businesses, you can just um, see if their employees want flowers on their desk. There's so many, so many opportunities. Grocery stores, preferably smaller ones that don't have like a ton of red tape that you have to, I mean, it depends on the size that you're wanting to get to. Grocery store sales are great, um, but you also are dealing with, you know, a big business. <laughs> Events and weddings, that's where most flower growers are getting the bulk of their money. But because I, you know, we have issues with Sabbath, you know, work, it's not the greatest for me. But if an event comes up that's weekday, I would take it. Question? What about churches and funeral homes? Yeah, churches and funeral homes. You know, funeral homes, 
they're kind of they're kind of uh, stuck in their ways, like <laughs> gladiolas. <laughs> you know, they're not. It's you just have to think about who you're trying to sell to and what you're wanting to grow. You know, if you want to grow gladiolas, then General Homes would be a great a great one to work with. But uh-huh. you'd be selling to a florist, really, is what you'd be doing. And then those the florists would be selling to the funeral home, likely. And so I didn't put that down. I didn't even, yeah, florists are another great one. You just have to find a florist that's willing to pay a little bit more and is willing to work with you because they're usually, you know, they, they get their shipment on a certain day and they know what they're getting. But if you can find somebody that's willing to work with you, I think florists are a great opportunity. And the neat thing is you can introduce them to flowers that they're not getting, like zinnias. They're not getting zinnias. They probably aren't even familiar with them because they don't hold well. Same thing with dahlias. You know, dahlias are a very hot item right now, and it's because they can't be shipped. And so that's kind of an in that you can have as a local grower. You can provide something that they're not getting elsewhere. And I'm definitely going to look into that this next season. <clears throat> so some supplies. Seeds I get from Johnny's, or like I already mentioned, Geo Seeds. It has a great, great amount of variety. They're a little bit more old-fashioned. They like you to call in your order, but, you know, you just get over that and call it in instead of order it online. Um, Snips, Felco. I have mine are from this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's short for his name, Am Leonard. <laughs> and you, you want to look under pruning shears. That's where you're going to find them. And the buckets I get from Lowe's. The craft paper that I showed you, the rolls, I get from Lowe's. They're like... Yeah, they're $4 for 180 feet. So not bad price. Jute from Hobby Lobby or Bailing Twine. Bailing Twine's cheaper. That's from TFC or Co-op. Some other resources. As I already mentioned, Florette Flowers. She has an awesome, awesome website with tons and tons of resources. So I would definitely check her out. Also, the Gardener's Workshop. That's um, Lisa Ziegler. She is one of my heroes in the flower world. She is in Virginia and has a great operation. She's, her website is more targeted to the home grower, but she has a lot of videos, a lot of seed starting demonstrations and tutorials. So I start my seeds like she does. She uses soil blocks, mini soil blocks, which I think is genius because a lot of people are dealing with constraint on space. And the other thing that she's big into is hardy annuals, which... Um, my garden that's full of right now. You don't realize how many flowers can actually be growing in the winter. You're not getting flowers in the winter, but your plants are developing, the root systems are growing. So come spring, you're going to get flowers way earlier than some other varieties. And Love and Fresh Flowers, she's a pharma florist out of Philadelphia, Jenny Love. She has some great resources for more of the Specialty flowers, I would say, Lysianthus. She has a great tutorial on Lysianthus. Um, great resources on that and Tulip, some of the other a little bit more complex ones. Then I want to I want to mention ASCFG, the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. If you are at all serious about doing flowers for a business, I would highly recommend you joining the association. It's $199 a year, but what you get is so worth it. You get tons of materials. They do conferences. They do a big national conference every year, and then they also do regional conferences. And not only can you go to those at a discounted rate, but they video them all and provide them for free. So I have learned it so much from all the videos that they post, and they have everything from like a price list. So you're wondering what you should price your stuff at. They have a price list for every single flower by stem, and just a, a huge resource. So if you're at all serious, check them out, ASCFG.org. Those four, Florette Flowers, J. Flora Designs, Dahlia May Flower Farm, and Flourish Flower Farm, those are four that I really like on Instagram. If you're serious about this, follow people that you really like their style, you really like their bouquets, and the more more stuff that you see, the more flowers that you see, you'll you'll learn about new varieties. Um, J. Floral Designs did a hashtag recently that's really caught on called Fave cut flowers, and I would check that out. Basically, all these different flower growers have tagged pictures of their favorite cut flowers. So that's another, that's a huge resource there. You can see what other people are calling their favorite cut flowers. 
And then, last but not least, Slow Flowers podcast. I listen to that once a week. And these are just flower resources. There's so many resources just on growing vegetables, you know, growing in general, you know, more geared towards vegetables because flower, flower farming might be a little more new. There's not as many people doing it. So these are just, these are just three books. Actually, Florette Aaron Benzikane, her book is actually not out yet. It was supposed to be out this month, but I think they moved it to next month. But that's going to be an awesome, awesome book. Definitely recommend that one. Cool Flowers, that's all about growing hardy annuals. So if you're interested in that, she's a great, great writer, presenter. And then the Flower Farmer book, that one's been out for a while. It's also a favorite. I love that one. So those are just a few, but I would say my dad had a resource sheet for just growing in general, marketing, growing. And so Expand Your Horizons, you might want to get a hold of that. There's just great resources that are going to aid you in your flower growing but aren't necessarily directly about flowers. So, is it? Somebody, okay. So that's great. The flower farming book's on the Ad Agri table. So that's it. Questions? About how many bouquets would you prepare each week as a uh, farmer's Yeah, so bouquets, I'm still on a pretty small scale. I do probably like 15 bouquets, and then throughout the season, um, like autumn, I did a bunch of pumpkins, and I did also tins. I call them table tins, recycled tin cans that I put arrangements in. So I kind of experimented with some other things.